Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another in a series of unexpected conversations sponsored by the Center for Innovation. It's a personal privilege for me to welcome today's speaker, Elizabeth Rosenthal. Dr. Rosenthal has won critical claim for her uh, reporting in the New York Times um, in a series called Paying Till It Hurts. Her new book, which you see here, was, a re was released just about a month ago. Um, I have to tell you that it uh, has been required reading in the Center for Innovation. And the reason for that is because there is so much in her, in her experience and her writing that matches what we have seen in our own research in the Center for Innovation. Um, and just quickly, our research has told, us, has told us time and time again that affordability is the single greatest fear that people have about health and their health care. Very often they think of the healthcare system as being very opaque, not very transparent, and not very understanding of their needs. And the reason that we've invited Elizabeth back, and a couple of years ago she was part of our annual transform, the reason we've invited her back is because her vision matches that that we have had and our goal to create a delivery system that will produce an unparalleled experience of health for people that is based first on a fundamental understanding of the needs of people, with solutions then created to meet those needs and done in a way that creates an adaptable system that gets better. So we are very focused on the experience then of health. Now, Elizabeth, although known for these series, I must tell you is quite an accomplished journalist. Although she began her career as a science writer for the New York Times, her journalistic career has taken her far and abroad, um, being posted as a correspondent for the Times in Beijing, and then later being posted in Europe before returning to the U.S. to work for the Times in, uh, in her award-winning series. Um, in the last year, she has joined the Kaiser Health Network as the editor-in-chief. The Kaiser Health Network um, is a remarkable source of news, and soon, under her leadership, will become an even more powerful source of investigative reporting and analytics. Um, supported by the Kaiser Family Foundation, separate from Kaiser Permanente or other Kaisers that you might be familiar with, um, this organization, in terms of its news and analytics, produces content that is used by well-known outlets across the country. So the Washington Post, the New York Times, NPR, um, and others. Um, you will begin to see more from her and from her colleagues that I think you will find to be quite intriguing. Uh, we're pleased that she would come and spend time with us today in this conversation. The format, for those of you who have not been here before, is to let her speak for a little while, but then to have at least half of the time for discussion and questions that would come from all of you. So we're very pleased that so many of you would come today to be part of the conversation. And with that, let me introduce to you Elizabeth Rosenthal, an award-winning journalist, to discuss some interesting problems and opportunities in American health care. Dr. Rosenthal. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me here at um, Mayo. I, I often say um, that it, I'm really thrilled to have good audiences like this because my husband and my kids are really sick of me talking about healthcare. <laughs> so uh, it's always great to be around people who want to hear my, uh, my tirades. <laughs> um, and I hope there won't be that. But anyway, so I just wanted to say something first about the backdrop for this book. Um, because, you know, some people have said, oh, it's anti-medicine, it's anti-doctor. I don't see that at all. I'm a, I trained as a physician. Um, I, my dad was a physician, and to me it's a kind of uh, a work of passion for what the profession, how it's strayed and where it can go. Um, ironically, I, I left the practice of medicine in the early 90s to write for the New York Times. Um, I'd been a, a, an ER doctor in New York and um, f doing a lot of freelancing, and then something came along called the, um, the Clinton Health Reform Plan, um, which some of you may remember. And uh, I was working in it, when I was working in the ER, at that time in the early 90s, the uh, health system, I thought, was working pretty well for people like me who had good insurance, but it was already not serving the needs very well of 
people who were poor or uninsured who I was seeing in the emergency room. So I thought, um, I'll go to the Times, I'll write about this for a few years, it will pass, and um, I'll go back to being a doctor. And of course, um, as we all know, it, it didn't, um, and I didn't. I kind of got hooked on journalism. And um, thank you, <laughs> whoever's lowering this. <laughs> thank you, that's great. Um, there we go, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, that's how I kind of made the shift and I never really went back. Um, and sadly to me, many of the problems we're talking about now with our health delivery system are kind of the same problems I noticed in the early 90s that were pretty small and now they're kind of on steroids. So um, I think we need to do something. So then, of course, after the, the Clinton health bill failed, I took a bunch of overseas assignments, of, as you've heard. Um, and that also played into this book because on my overseas travels, I'd um, experienced health care in a number of other countries. Um, I, and now I'm going to sound pretty accident prone, but um, I'm not. <laughs> um, in, uh, I, I broke a wrist jogging in Stockholm and the New York Times found me like the, the most super duper uh, orthopedist in Stockholm who saw me in his office at, at a hospital, uh, sent me next door for an x-ray, casted my wrist and um, apologized profusely for charging me about $400 on, on the private market. Um, my next accident <laughs> occurred. Um, I, I cut my forehead in Rome, um, and uh, you know it was over a weekend, so I went to uh, Gemelli Hospital, which is the Pope's hospital, so no shabby place, um, although it doesn't look like any hospital in the U.S. It's rather basic looking from the outside. And at Gemelli, um, I got eight stitches in my forehead and was charged about $100. So, you know, that kind of informed my thinking as I was hearing stories from my colleagues in the U.S. I was away between 97 and 2007 about how expensive healthcare was becoming. And I saw, you know, in my, my own insurance, suddenly in 97, we weren't paying any premiums. Suddenly we were contributing to premiums and we were, the, each year the deductibles and co-payments would go up. So in 2007, I came back to the U.S. Um, I was at that golden age where um, I needed my first screening colonoscopy, which in many ways is the predecessor for this series. Um, I, I knew things had gotten really expensive, so I, I went to the HR office and said, well, how can I get this test that I know I need um, without paying a lot? And they said, oh, you just have to go to an in-network provider and showed me how to look at the list. And I saw there was a certain cancer hospital on the list um, that was in network, so uh, luckily for me, I, I signed up for their screening colonoscopy clinic. And I trained partly at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering, to name names. Um, so I kind of knew the structure of the hospital, and I went to the appointed room, and I thought, wow, this is weird. I'm going to the admitting office. Um, and I got my hospital wristband, and I got, you know, they took away my clothes, and I got my bonnet and was put on a stretcher and rolled into um, a full-blown operating room, basically. There were beeping monitors and anesthesiologists and, you know, a lot of people in scrubs and nurses. And I thought, wow, this is a little weird. You know, why, why, why I'm having this screening colonoscopy and I'm in this OR at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, but a, a little push of propofol kind of eliminated my concerns. <laughs> happily, and, um, and I woke up with a, a clean bill of colon health, which was great, um, and didn't think much more about it until about a month later where I got the explanation of benefits, which I looked at because I'm kind of a wonk about these things, and saw that um, the hospital had charged about $11,000 for my screening colonoscopy, and my insurer, you know, he, we've all seen those happy notes saying that, you know, we bargained this down on your behalf to um, $9,000 and, you know, the good news, your patient payment is zero. So I guess I should have felt like that was good news, but um, I didn't um, because I knew and um, it's become my kind of obsession that a, a nation that's paying 
11,000 or even $9,000 for screening colonoscopies ends up exactly where we are today, which is, uh, you know, spending two to three times as much as any other country on health care, and not spending it in a, in a way that um, really attends to many of the health needs that we all know are out there. So anyway, um, now you know why the first article in the Pain Till It Hurts series was about colonoscopy. Um, much to the distress of the photo editor at the New York Times. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, and as part of that, I learned how much was, is paid for screening colonoscopies in other countries um, and discovered that in much of Europe, um, they're billed at about $350. So um, now we know, you know, we, I wanted to call this book, We Don't Get What We Pay For. But, um, you know, I think in American Sickness is a better title. Um, so anyway, um, this is not to say that there are, um, you know, bad physicians at the back of those colonoscopes. It's to say that we're working, we're all working in a system that really doesn't allow um, doctors and their patients to focus on what's important in medicine. Um, and, and it's a system that rewards, uh, that, that's overly infused, in my view at least, on business at this point in time. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask with the book, and the, you know, as, as with everything, uh, this, the book does grow out of the series in a little bit. At the end of the series, we'd ask for patient, or we'd ask for reader comments. Um, my email was out there, and we ended up with over 20,000 comments. Many of them were really <coughs> distressing stories, both from patients and from um, physicians who said, do you want to know what happened at my institution? From residents who said, you know, I'm being told to order all these MRIs, and you know what, no one's telling me how much they cost, and I know from my training that these are not all smart MRIs to be ordering. Why am I having to do this? Um, from, uh, you know, uh, obstetricians who called to say, you know, hey, I just noticed that... Um, a lot of my patients, I'd always put on this one oral contraceptive. It was really popular. And it's just been pulled from the market and replaced with a branded chewable version of the pill that now costs $150. What's going on here? So there was story after story after story, and that ultimately became the book. You should know that everyone in the book and um, in the series are people who contacted me through social media or through my email. So I didn't have to go out and look for exceptional stories. These were, on the whole, you know, New York Times readers who are mostly well insured, who were, as one of them said to me, trying to make it work in a system that just doesn't work. And I think if they were falling on these troubles, um, imagine what people who have poor insurance or not a lot of disposable income or not the knowledge to push back or leave a comment on a website at the New York Times. What are they to do? So, um, so you know, I, and part of my, my um, experience in other countries was, was and, and I heard from a lot of people overseas too, and their comments were like, why do you Americans put up with this stuff? You know, how can you, how can you deal with this? Um, people who said they were afraid to come to, and I know, you know, some of them come to places like Mayo or to where I train, New York Presbyterian, for the amazing care. Um, but others, uh, if they have a serious illness, other people from overseas are afraid to come to this country now because they're worried about, like, what if I get injured? What if I play soccer and break my ankle? You know, how am I going to pay for that? Um, there are also people who, uh, there was one German guy who's um, in the book who was in a little bike crash in San Francisco. Uh, he wasn't terribly hurt, but an ambulance came along and scooped him up and took him to San Francisco General Hospital, something he wouldn't have thought about twice about if he were in Germany. But guess what? Because he came in by ambulance, and he did, I think, have a, um, he was bumped him. you know, he was pretty, pretty badly bruised up. The triage nurse called the trauma team, um, and that call to the trauma team who didn't need to see him in the end as it became clear that he wasn't badly hurt, 
um, generated a $10,000 trauma activation fee. Now, you know, the trauma, I'm sure the triage nurse didn't know that merely calling the trauma team would generate that fee. Um, and I'm sure no physician on the trauma team would have supported that, but there it was. Um, in the book, you'll, you'll, read, you'll meet two people who I call healthcare refugees, people who've moved out of the U.S. because they were afraid of healthcare costs. Um, that to me is really tragic. Uh, one woman named Tiffany Spivy, who's living in Turkey, who decided not to come home to have her second child because uh, she said there were uh, 20,000 reasons, and that was dollars that she would be charged in the U.S. Um, Another student at Washington University who's finishing her PhD who has type 1 diabetes with good insurance is only looking for jobs overseas because in, in countries, she's looking in Germany and the UK, because even with good insurance, the cost of uh, having type 1 diabetes in our country is, is so high, and that's partly because of the pumps and the meters and the business model for those. It's also because the price of insulin in our country has gone up about 400% um, in the last five years, I believe, um, because of patent disputes among some of the big pharmaceutical manufacturers. So um, who can blame her for leaving? So anyway, the first half of the book, you'll, you'll hear lots of um, distressing tales and how it came to be, because that was a big question for me as someone who saw the end result and thought no one would design this system. And I think the uh, it's a classic case, as I trace the history of it, of the road to hell being paved in good intentions, where you see, you know, first there's um, health insurance, and in, like in the good old days, like I said, no one was, felt like nobody was paying. I didn't pay the premium, I didn't pay the deductible. And what you saw during that era of nobody paying was a kind of slow, starting to spiral upward of, of prices, because if nobody's paying, uh, if like my dad, you were charging a, a patient at your office, you might have charged $20, but when it seems like nobody's paying, it, that charge goes up to 200 and then 500 And then what you see around the turn of the century um, is, is more and more business people coming into healthcare. Um, to a point where around 2000 you see, and I, mean, I saw this at my hospital first, you know, the, the, the ward nurses were replaced by nurse managers and then there were more um, people with MBAs. And that was all, you know, hospitals were terribly inefficient places. So there was, it wasn't like there was no room for efficiency. Um, but what you see around the turn of the century is um, Deloitte and McKinsey and some of the big consulting firms coming into hospitals. Um, and these are hospitals now having just faced the pressure from HMOs and cost cutting. And basically what the consultants tell them is, how can you do exactly what you're doing now but bill a lot more for it? How can you manipulate billing? Um, that's legal, but so they'll say, look, you know, you haven't been charging for recovery room time. That's a missed opportunity. Why don't you, you know, you can charge for recovery room time. And pretty soon you see a flat fee for the recovering room time turning into we're billing every 15 minutes of recovery time. And then someone says, wow, look at that oxygen, those green tubes that are stuck up a patient's nose after surgery that, you know, we used to joke when I was a resident, they're usually blowing oxygen into the pillow. Um, you know, that you can charge for that. And not you're going to charge by the day, but you're going to charge by the minute. Um, you can charge $17 for a Tylenol. You know, there are kind of no limits once you start in this uh, system of gaming. And, and um, you know, of course, then we see what we're seeing now, which is, you know, then people start charging facility fees. So there's the doctor fee and there's the facility fee. And then facilities buy doctor's offices and rebrand them as hospitals. I'm, I don't know if that's going on here in much of the country. And so suddenly patients are stuck going to their same doctor's office, getting the same tests as they've always had, that same x-ray in the office. And suddenly there's a facility fee that dwarfs the amount that the doctor charged. And suddenly um, the x-ray that used to cost $50 in a doctor's office costs $500 because it's being done in a hospital. So anyway, um, 
there's a lot of gaming going on that's motivated by the business of healthcare rather than the values of healthcare, and that's what I hope we can get back to. Um, I'll, I'm going to talk very quickly about just some ideas about how that happens. The second part of the book is all about, it kind of lays out a menu of how we can get back to a better place. And I'm not looking for the end result, you know, do we go to uh, total transparency? Do we go to a single payer system? I think that's for the voters to decide and for patients and doctors to decide. But I wanted to point out in the second half of the book that we do have lots of options and that it kind of behooves all of us, both patients and physicians, to start turning that ship of costs around and make the system focus more on patient needs. You know, when I started writing the book, one of my aha moments was as a reporter I'd written, writing about the ACA, I talked about, you know, we're innovating to get to patient-centered evidence-based care. I've, I've written that phrase so many times. That's the point of innovation. Patient-centered evidence-based care. And then at some point when I started researching the book, I was like, well, wait a second, what other kind of health care could there be? You know, that is what health care is. It's patient-centered, it's evidence-based, and we've kind of strayed from that. So lots of little th things that I think physicians and our institutions can do um, to start turning that ship around. And part of it is to think about costs and the process as part of that patient bill of rights to have more information. Um, it makes me a little nuts when I look at the hospitals in New York and the Patient Bill of Rights includes things like um, the right to a non-smoking room when non-smoking has been illegal in hospitals for um, decades. Um, and it doesn't have on there the right to know how much I'm going to be paying, to know how much this treatment is going to cost me. Now, we, we hear over and over again, oh, we can't tell you that. You know, it's, if you ask a hospital, they go, we don't know, you know. Well, they have something called the charge master, which is hidden. I mean, that will give a notional price. Um, I would start there. You know, let's ask all the hospitals to publish their charge masters and their price list because if they had to do that, and I, I understand, you know, that everyone will say nobody pays that, you know, they're highly inflated. Um, if the hospital where I got my colonoscopy had to publish a price list that said $11,000 for colonoscopy, they wouldn't be charging it. You know, there's a, there's an embarrassment factor in this. Um, I think it behooves physicians to put pressure on their hospitals to release information about pricing and cost. Um, we act like it's impossible in France, as I've seen. You know, there are price lists on physician walls. Um, in Australia, and this is endorsed by the Australian Medical Society, when you go into a hospital, it's considered your patient right to have an estimate of the costs and to know what your portion is going to be. Um, you know, hospitals do it for Medicare, uh, where they pay a fat, flat fee. Um, maybe they should do it for the average patient, too. Um, I would like also physicians, and I know this takes um, some learning, um, to learn about the prices that different facilities, uh, x-ray facilities and labs to learn, charge in your neighborhood. Because I want to go, I, I want my, and I do now in New York, I partner with my physician in the sense of I want him to refer me to the lab that charges um, $7 for that blood test instead of $700 for the blood test. Even though his computer now, and this is a little bit of an ask for him, because he's part of a hospital system, his computer is programmed to order that lab from the hospital lab. But he knows and I know that that's going to be hundreds of times more expensive than sending me to LabCorp uh, or Quest. Um, it's a little extra work for him because he has to fill out the form, but as a patient, I appreciate how much money it saves me. And it also sends a message to our system that um, we're not going to tolerate these crazy ranges of prices anymore and that we want um, better answers. Um, I don't want to hear any more, which I hear over and over again at billing offices, don't worry, um, your insurer will cover it, why do you care? 
because A, increasingly that's not true, as we all know, and um, we all should care. You know, we should care that our colonoscopy is, is, is being billed at $11,000, which is why I tell patients, you know, look at the hospital. I tell doctors, ask your patients to show you a hospital bill, and I tell patients, open those bills. It's always tempting to just think, oh, what a headache, I'm not going to look. But, and to ask for itemization. Um, one patient in the book got a bill for $45,000, and it was labeled miscellaneous with a $3,000 copayment. And it was for her that tipping point, which I think so many Americans have reached, of like, I'm not going to take this anymore. She's a lawyer. She's like, miscellaneous, that's crazy. So she called the hospital, um, which is, uh, was... Uh, a Swedish hospital in, in Seattle and said, um, tell me what, you know, tell me what miscellaneous means. So then she got a broad breakdown, you know, OR supplies, uh, room charge. And she said, no, I want to know really what it means. Um, and one joke I, I, I made with her is I've seen the hospital bill for uh, a hip replacement in Belgium um, it's two and a half pages, and I can understand what's being charged, even though it's in Flemish, you know, which I, you can't say. I mean, it's, you know, two-person camera, the implant in three parts, and it, you know, so I think we should all, both physicians and patients, look f towards that. And the last thing I want to bring up before we throw this open to discussion is, because um, it's really... Well, maybe I'll do two things that I can't, that I have to get out of my bonnet before we. we um, one is this business of surprise medical charges, which is really, really hurting people. And, um, you know, it's when you go to an in network hospital and we tell all of our patients, all of, you know, everyone is, uh, oh, you have to be a great, you have to be a better consumer of healthcare. Well, um, the people I speak to are really great consumers of healthcare, they're trying their best. But how can you be a good consumer where there's no prices, you don't have a choice, and you go to an in-network emergency room, and the, even the ER doctor is out of network? You know, you can't be a good consumer of medicine that way. So um, in New York, there are now, there's now a bill that, uh, that it doesn't prevent, and this is my, my one little bee in my bonnet, um, it doesn't prevent the hospital from billing you or from the doctors from billing you. But if you know enough to know the law exists, you can say, I'm not paying that charge. And the way you can, so if you get a surprise out of network charge, and I've exercised this, right? Um, you know, as the patient, you have to know that the law exists. You have to know where to download the form from on the New York State Health Department website. And then you have to, I kid you not, um, mail it you know, who else uses mail? You have to mail it in triplicate to your insurer and the hospital and tell them that you're not paying and they can work it out. You know, in my ideal world, if I go to an in-network hospital, at the very least, the ER doctor should be in-network. The hospital knows that. I don't. And I would say if, as a patient going to an in-network hospital, it should be the hospital's job to make sure every doctor who's sets foot in my room and touches me, is also in network. They know that. I don't. Um, they know what insurance I have. And the last thing I'll say is about, so I think we really need a remedy for these surprise charges, um, is, and I understand that doctors sometimes get into them because the insurers are really ratcheting down rates, and that's terrible, particularly for primary care doctors who we say we, we care about and we want to reward, but we're not. Um, and so people get around that by, you know, doing uh, having a lab or doing, you know, doing some extra tests. But uh, I think that just leaves patients caught in the middle of this argument, which is essentially with the insurers, not not with your patients. Um, finally, drug pricing. We need a much better solution for this. Um, and I know we'll talk about this more at Transform. Um, uh, you know, every other country in the world has some way to. Uh, control drug prices. Uh, some countries do it by a national negotiation with pharmaceutical companies. Others do it by looking at three adjacent countries and saying what, what's called reference pricing, we'll pay what they pay. Um, if we did that in the U.S., we would decrease our drug costs by probably two-thirds immediately if we said, okay, you know, 
pick the three most expensive countries and we'll, you know, average that and we'll pay just that aside from the U.S. Um, you know, the other solution that's been brought up is uh, allowing drug importation. Um, there are, you know, uh, I think many physicians, I know there were buses that senators ran from Minnesota to go to Canada um, to, to buy cheaper drugs. Uh, people on the southern border go to Mexico. Um, we all know in surveys about 8% of people, Americans go overseas to buy prescription drugs. Um, I would guess that that, that surveys, uh, that number is actually much higher because um, you're asking people if they're doing something which is currently illegal. Uh, so I don't know how many people will, will uh, acknowledge that. Anyway, I, I don't pretend to, to know what the right answer is, but I know it's, it's a huge burden for patients, a huge burden for um, health systems, and, uh, and it's something that every other country has solved. And I would say that it's something that um, there is bipartisan support for. You know, every time there's a, a Martin Shkreli or an EpiPen crisis, we hear from both sides of the aisle, you know, we've got to do something, and we've got to, and there are hearings, and you know, for for over a decade, as my colleagues in D.C. point out, um, uh, your senator here, um, Senator Klobuchar, Klobuchar, and uh, um, and John McCain have been proposing bills for to allow importation. Um, likewise, uh, Senator Sanders and a few of his Republican colleagues have proposed another, a different kind of importation bill. Um, you know, in the end, there's a lot of lobbying that prevents those from passing. I think that's a significant factor. Um, but this is where I think patients need to um, make their needs and their voice known, and their physicians need to speak up. And we, we were saying this morning, you know, uh, I'm seeing for the first time groups like the American Society of Clinical Oncology and some very prominent oncologists being very loud about their opposition to drug pricing and what it's done to their patients. And I think we need to see a lot more of that. So thank you, everyone. Um, I hope we can have a good discussion from here, because that's, <laughs> thank you. So as we get uh, technically enabled here, um, are there any questions that people have right away? There will be microphones that are coming down the aisles. While we're waiting, I'm intrigued by the difference between Americans and Europeans and Asians. Um, what makes us as a nation either more naive or less willing to push our politicians to seek some of these solutions to drug pricing? I mean, why do we continue to accept the idea that we have to pay three times more for medications just because a pharmaceutical company says we need that for research and development? Well, I, I think, A, we have, um, you know, we have in a way been backed into being um, if you believe the, the, the narrative about R&D, we have been kind of backed into paying for the world's research and development. Um, so uh, I think, you know, when I hear the argument, well, you know, Germany's not paying us enough to underwrite research and development, I, my answer is fine, well, then charge bargain harder with Germany. You know, we, part of the reason we pay so much is we are the only ones that have no mechanism for not paying so much, right? So if you're, you know, uh, uh, people will want to say, well, you know, a lot of people will say pharma are the bad guys. Um, they're for-profit companies, and this is, they're looking for opportunities, and we have handed this opportunity over on a golden platter. And so until we decide to not do that, I don't see how you can expect um, a for-profit company to do anything else. They're not charities. Um, the other thing I would say is, is we've really bought into the narrative of um, because we pay so much, we get better drugs and we get better drugs first. That's sometimes true. You know, the, 
but it's only true where they're very pro where they're profitable drugs. So sometimes, you know, we've all seen the newest heart failure drug or the newest cancer drug. It does come to the U.S. first because why is that? It's often because pharma will set its price point by the price it gets in the U.S. and that serves as a bargaining point in other countries. Um, but I think the question then becomes, what's the value of those treatments and what's the value for our general health? I mean, then we see, we get in this crazy position where we see a lot of these very, very new high-priced drugs advertised on TV. Even though they're orphan drugs and technically will only um, treat under 200,000 people. So why are they on TV? You know, there's a, a, a chapter in the book about, uh, maybe you've seen the ads for non-24, um, a sleeping medicine for people who are, have, it's a sleep, it's a real sleep-wake sleep-wake cycle disorder in people who are totally blind. But why is that being advertised on TV? Um, what's the strategy there? Um, and you'll follow in the book, one of the best parts is how it goes through the FDA approval process where the approvers are all extremely uncomfortable with this drug because it's a melatonin analog. And they're, and, and, um, they're, they're all saying, including the guy who discovered the sleep-wake disorder, non-24, in the 1990s and, and saw that it could be treated with melatonin like why are you guys inventing a drug that's just kind of melatonin and, um, and, and, and advertising? Why are you selling this stuff? And, you know, you see it go through the process where it's a business opportunity, right? I mean, that's basically the answer. You can't patent melatonin. You can patent this melatonin analog. Um, because it went through the orphan drug track, which, you know, we've done a lot of work at Kaiser Health News about how that can be misused for profit. Um, they didn't have to do big studies on it. In fact, they had done big studies on this drug, and it wasn't particularly better than any of the other sleep aids out there. So they went the orphan drug route. They found a condition that affected under 200,000 Americans. Once you go in the orphan drug route, um, you don't have to do a big study anymore. The study involved, I think, 60 patients and lasted three months. Um, and everyone in the medical world looked at this and thought, wow, this is a non-starter, you know. The results, even in that short study that, that of only 60 patients, were pretty lackluster. I mean, it shortened the, 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 the uh, average sleep time from like four hours to three hours and 15 minutes. And so you see all the people on the FDA approval panel being really, really uncomfortable with this. They say, why don't you just give melatonin? That's cheap. Or what, you know, an extra 45 minutes of sleep, that's pretty dreadful. Um, and, and, you know, why don't you just tell them, tell these people to take, uh, you know, Ambien and, and get an alarm clock. And, and, you know, the drug company answers back again and again, you're being heartless. There's a serious medical need. And they fly in patients who say things like, um, and you can read this transcript. Um, you know, uh, being blind uh, is not a problem. My problem is non-24. Um, and in the end, because the FDA standard, which we accepted um, at a time when medicine wasn't very commercial, all it is is it has to be safe and effective, and effective <coughs> compared to placebo, not effective compared to melatonin. Um, and so that study was never done. It was never compared to melatonin. And the panel had no choice but to prove the drug because it, it checked off cleverly all the boxes. Um, and, and they kind of comforted themselves because they said, well, how much could they possibly charge for this? You know, it's, it's melatonin. It's, you know. um, and they charged $8,000 a month. Um, and you know, by some calculations, you only have to sell about 1,000 scripts to make back their investment. So we get that kind of drug that no other country looking at this would, would buy, right? Um, and the ultimate goal, I think, is probably to use it as a jet lag remedy, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. They're now testing it for jet lag, but they got it approved the easy way. Um, so we get, you know, we get some high-priced drugs that are really <laughs> useful. 
Um, we get some high-priced drugs that have merely checked off the boxes and are not useful at all. And I also like to point out there are things that we don't get because there isn't a good commercial model for them. And I had this experience. My daughter was, um, was at uh, Princeton when there was a meningitis B outbreak there. Um, there was a men B vaccine, and the treatment for that is, of course, you, you vaccinate the, 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 pop, the subpopulation where the outbreak's occurring. There was a, I, I was surprised as she was, you know, they were telling them, you know, don't share beer glasses and things like that. <clears throat> but I was surprised in reading about it to discover there was a men B vaccine approved in England, in Canada, in Australia, and the rest of the world. And the company had not taken it here. Um, and it, the FDA had not gone through the approval process because there was no business model. No one, you know, it was not a moneymaker here. So we did not have that drug for almost a year until the FDA and the CDC could do an emergency importation process. Now, P.S., now that, you know, those outbreaks at Princeton and UC Santa Barbara got publicized, now there is a market. Now they're marketing this men B vaccine to all worried parents before your kids go to, go to college. college. <coughs> I'm sorry, that's a long answer, but. <laughs> Tony? So uh, why do you think uh, HHS, HHS Secretary Tom Price is hesitant to roll out these bundled payments more widespread? Because you think, you know, fixed price would just eliminate the variability of all these procedures out there. Mm. Well, <laughs> that's, um, I think, uh, <laughs> this is a bit of probably medical sociology, I think. I mean, the bundled payments for hip and knee replacements, the hospitals that try, I mean, first of all, they work to control costs very well. Um, the hospitals that tried them, I know NYU in New York was one of them, on the whole, we're pretty happy with it. I think they thought it was, it, you know, maybe not every individual was happy, but it did function as intended. You know, this is where you give a, a, a bundled payment of um, a certain amount of money and say to the hospital, you guys figure out how you want to use it. Um, and it tends to be much less than the list price. Um, I think philosophically, he's very opposed to this idea. You know, he's a private practice orthopedist from, Atlanta, um, and it requires a really different way of thinking about medicine and the collaboration involved than people my age, because he is around my age, trained with. And I think that's really uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, personally, I think it's pretty necessary if we're guarding the resources that our patients get. Uh, uh, you know, another example of the bundled payments is um, some of the big employers and unions in California have done essentially the same thing. They'll, they'll set a reference price. They'll say, we're going to pay. They go out and do research and say, what's a reasonable price for a hip or knee replacement in California that's high quality? And I think they came up with something around $40,000. And then they said, that's what we're going to pay. If people want to go to a more expensive place, and I have plenty of bills for hip replacements and knee replacements in California that are well over 100000 um, you can go to the more expensive place, but you're going to have to pay. Um, and what that did was interesting because it both encouraged patients to look around and see, look for value, but also a huge percentage of those hospitals that were charging Eighty, a hundred thousand dollars looked at that because it was a large group of patients and said, "Oh, okay, we can do it for that." So it had that kind of dual effect of making both patients and providers more conscientious about care. And they looked at, um, you know, I think the doctors are are a bit stuck in this because when there's a bundled price for a hip or knee replacement, what I hear from orthopedists, which is a genuine concern, <laughs> is that, you know, if you thought pharma um, ha had us backed into a corner, device makers are pharma on steroids, I would say, because they, um, you know, say you get a bundled price of $35,000. Well, there are three or four device makers left in the U.S. who make uh, hips and knees. Um, a lot of people in the industry call them the cartel. 
you know, they can charge and do charge really, really high prices for the much higher than in Belgium, where the same striker hip would be, you know, five thousand dollars would go for twenty-five here or twenty thousand here. I don't know the exact number, but so until we have a way to control those prices, you know, I think orthopedists and some physicians who deal with device makers are worried that they're going to be stuck in a very untenable situation where, you know, they're getting a reference price payment and 95% of that is eaten up by buying this device. And, you know, our solution, instead of setting some kind of rational or national pricing, is to say, and you see this crazy um, amplification now of the supply chain of, you know, Devices are too expensive, so the hospitals get a device negotiator, and the device manufacturer has a device salesman, and there are device brokers in the middle, and there's someone calculated there are 13 stages of people taking, and each one takes off, you know, 5 10% profit. So this is where you get at the end Heather Bresch, you know, charging $600 for uh, an EpiPen and saying, well, actually, we don't get that because it's all these middlemen. And everyone is kind of true, right? You know, it's not any one person's fault, but the system has created this this kind of... But the patients are hurt. You know, that's my thing. Well, the patients are the ones who are left holding the bag with these crazy prices. So, you know, what I'm describing takes different kinds of interventions. It may take a kind of reference or bundled pricing, and then some way to control those intermediary costs, which are high in this country. You know, how can we, how can we push back against the prices of medical devices? Some uh, smaller, some, some orthopedic hospitals have, have tried to use the kind of volume, you know, we're only going to use one manufacturer's device and we're going to bargain really hard for it. Um, you have to win over the orthopedist who probably trained on different devices and, and may not be so comfortable with that. Um, and any one orthopedic practice probably doesn't have the bargaining power to get a really good price. So it's, it's really difficult. And for those of you who don't know, um, the device manufacturers have been extremely clever in cultivating relationships with <coughs> physicians, even far more so than the pharma companies. So, um, you know, they're, they're very attentive to orthopedics residents, and there's actually someone from the device maker in the OR when you get a hip or knee replacement. Um, technically there and, and in practice there to help make sure everything goes well. Um, and orthopedists have told me that's really valuable, um, but it's also probably very distorting to our pricing of devices. Other questions, comments? That's, it's striking to me that consumers feel somewhat powerless. Yeah. And physicians, as you suggested, could be better informed purchasing agents or stewards of patients' resources. Yeah. But remarkably, physicians seem unwilling or unprepared to take on the role. What do we need to do? Well, um, you know, I think just, I, I mean, I, I understand that this is a burden to put on both patients and physicians. Like, I don't go to the hospital to think about prices, and <coughs> physicians didn't go to medical school to, um, you, you know, to, to argue with insurers, as they're having to do now. Um, so I would suggest that we could all be more proactive about it. And I think, you know, some of that is, and it's, it's why I encourage patients to ask, because I would love it if physicians knew which of the labs in their area were expensive or not. But people are busy, and, you know, the hospital comes in and says, oh, we're going to put in this EMR system in your office, and, you know, you're not think you're just thinking, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to deal with this yet another thing. Not really thinking, well, this EMR is programmed to to order my tests at the hospital lab. It's it's the, the business of medicine. I, I guess what I've learned from this book is it's very clever, very agile, and very sneaky. So it gives you something you want, 
but it may take something away from your relationship with your patients, and it may not give you most of what it promised. Um, so I think the, the classic is the promise of, uh, you know, um, electronic medical records, which in theory should make life easier and doesn't seem to have done so. Um, and it still means, you know, that when I, I say to my physician, I want my daughter's scan done outside because it's too expensive in the hospital, that in order to get that test result to the physician, I have to walk to the, the outside radiology thing and carry a floppy disk, you know, which I haven't seen in, you know, 10 years Ten anywhere years. else to, to, to the hospital. So, um, you know, I, I think we have to be on guard. And I, I think we could start by, and I hear, I speak to a lot of medical schools. Um, medical students mostly want to know this information. They're frustrated that it's not part of the, curriculum, understanding how this is built. Um, you know, it, ta it caught most doctors my age off guard because it wasn't an issue. And suddenly, you know, maybe if you're, you have a kind of bold patient, mm -hmm. they'll come in and say, uh, hey, doctor, as one patient, the one doctor in the book experience, you know, uh, thanks for taking out my appendix. But did you know there was like, and I feel much better. Did you know there was like a a $25,000 facility fee that I can't pay, you know? And he said, I realized at that point I'd cured my patient, um, but bankrupted his family, you know? And I think, so this kind of stuff happened while nobody was looking when, and I, I think we all have to be sadly attuned to it. So, you know, um, hospital systems will come in and offer a doctor, a deal which they almost can't refuse. We're going to buy your practice. We'll give you a nice salary. We'll take care of all the billing. Don't worry. You won't have to deal. You can just do what you do and see patients. Again, there's a physician in the book who had this experience with a California hospital system. Well, guess what he discovered? That his patients, what the charges to his patients had all tripled. Um, and that he could no longer refer to the radiologist that he liked. He had to refer to the one in the hospital. He eventually broke that partnership. But, you know, we're all kind of caught off guard by these charges. And that's what you see over and over in the book, both on the part of physicians and patients. Um, one of my favorite stories was an ENT doctor um, in Tennessee who got stuck in the OR with the with a needle, and as per protocol, he went to the ER for a blood draw at his hospital. You know, it's just, and um, he was shocked when he got a bill um, for a level five visit and a, a facility fee that totaled over four thousand dollars. And and it was like his wake up moment. Like, oh, is this is this how they're billing my patients? Um, so I think we have to be attuned. I think we should start teaching students early on about the cost differentials. I think a lot of them want to hear that. A lot of them I've spoken to will go to, you know, say they've gone to the, they, well, you've mentioned this before, they would like to see some prices on order sheets. I know that doesn't affect ordering, you'd said in studies, but I, I think all of those kind of signals to, um, to physicians would be helpful. Now, often they're intentionally not there, you know, and this is so, so I think we all have to ask, you know, when a, a detailed person comes in and says, wow, there's this great new drug, you know, there's one called, my favorite is, a, um, it's a combination of Pepsid and Motrin that some company has packaged together. And I'm sure when the, the detailed people go to doctor's offices, they don't say, this is going to cost $1,500 a month. They just say, we've got this great new drug, and if you have people on, you know, who have some pain and indigestion or, you know, you're worried about them taking a non-steroidal, it has some, you know, an H2 blocker in it too, but, um, or PPI, PPI in it too. Um, but you have to ask, you know, uh, if, well, what's it going to cost? And I, I think we all have to be wary of things like, the free samples and the copay coupons, which may pull people in initially, 
but then they won't be able to afford it. So is that really a good deal? Um, and maybe follow the lead of uh, ASCO and start, I'd love to see more of the specialty societies going to pharma and saying, instead of where they tend to be now is to say to the insurers, you should be covering this, say to pharma, why do all MS drugs cost two to three times as much in the U.S. as they do in England or Australia? You know, put some pressure on. You prescribe the drugs, so you have that, you control the market in a way, so. Other questions? In the back. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, sure. I've got a question. So if, if we take a, a very simple observation of the healthcare system, um, saying that um, pharma is one contributor to a, um, a big bill, there are other hospital costs that are also contributing to the bill. So, and the hospital could justify these high costs because it's got um, employees that it's paying uh, generously. So my direct question to you is, can someone campaign? Can a campaign be done to reduce the cost of health care without altering the salaries of these generously paid people? Yeah, and I think that's part of the problem. You know, you, when you talk about reducing costs and reducing that nearly 20% of GDP, you quickly get into this thing where everyone's pointing at everyone else, right? Like, well, I'm not the real problem. You know, the dermatologists only bill, you know, 0.5% of the problem, and drugs are only point, you know, are only 12%. And I think the truth is that everything and everyone <laughs> except perhaps some of the not very well-paid people on the front lines of medicine are going to have to see the money they make decrease. And, you know, would that be by demanding more nonprofit activity in our system? I mean, in the last century, insurers were, were not for profit. Now they are for profit. Maybe that's something we decide we want to change. I don't know. I would love to see... Part of the ACA was there were um, a number of insurance co-ops, nonprofit insurers started. Um, they, many of them went belly up because they, in, in part because they were underfunded. Um, but maybe that's a model we want to see. But I, I think, no, the answer is we have to really revalue how we, how we pay people for medicine too and for many physicians, that's going to involve less money. Um, maybe for some it will involve more. I mean, I, I'm always a little, when I looked at the physician income distribution these days, I was pretty distressed at how different it was than when I started in the sense of some of the best paid specialties are not people who provide what I think of as generally vital services or work, you know, or the ones who work day and night. I mean, I guess I don't really have so much trouble, and I, I, I'm really stepping into a minefield now, but, um, <laughs> but um, you know, with, with a neurosurgeon being paid well, um, I, I do have a problem with um, a suburban dermatologist in New Jersey being paid more than that neurosurgeon. That doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like we're valuing... So I think we have to decide what we want in medicine and then revalue those payments, which are now you know, directed heavily towards procedures, even though most patients, what do patients complain about? I don't get enough <coughs> face time with my doctor. What does doctors complain about? I have to see patients every five, 10 minutes. Well, maybe we really need to readjust those values, which were created at a really different time in medicine too. You know, it was a, it was a time where Testing was just, you know, it was new and exciting, and, and there were a lot of possibilities, but now a lot of those procedures that we're reimbursing very heavily are not, they're not, they're actually the opposite of helpful. They're, they're, they're not useful, but we still continue to reimburse them as if, you know, it was the first time anyone had done a procedure. So you said that you wanted to get us started on a conversation in the book. Yeah. And so I'm pleased that you would come to Mayo and help us get started. So I think all of us can start thinking about what we might do 
to carry forward this beginning conversation. How do we be better at explaining things to patients? How do we offer patients good transparent information about prices and how do we discuss facility fees? And perhaps every one of us who is a physician should learn how much the physician how much the facility fee is for that one procedure that I do or the several procedures that I do. So I'm hopeful that the conversation today has gotten us started at Mayo and I hope too that Mayo can actually lead the conversation nationally as well. Thanks Elizabeth so, for coming to I, join I, us. I don't think we're gonna find the solution from Washington, so I think this is gonna be <laughs> <laughs> something that, that plays itself out in all of our hospitals and all of our lives and uh, we better start here and today. <laughs> and thank all of you for Thanks. coming to this conversation and those who are watching on the network and on uh, webcasting. Thanks again. I hope this gets us all started on a good conversation. Thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you.